Rushing Wind Biker Church at 129 Knickerbocker Avenue in Bohemia, New York, the crossroad of freedom and faith. God bless you. Amen. Amen. Hey, I see smiles today. That's a good thing. Let's open in prayer. Father, we, uh, we come to you, Lord. <sighs> Father, tonight, let us concentrate on your Son. Father, give us a deeper awareness that everything is about Jesus. Lord, as we, uh, we're invited into this conversation by, by John, the beloved apostle, Father, let us, uh, let us hear his heart as he cries out to a church that has started to make things about uh, things that it shouldn't be. Lord, he tries to regroup everyone back to the cross of Jesus Christ, reminding them that Jesus is the end of the journey, that he's our all in all. Lord, give us an ear to hear what you want to say to your church today, and I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this has been uh, uh, an interesting week putting messages together you know um, every once in a while you know you, you pick up the Bible and you read something and see one of the one of the great things about preaching through the Bible is you you hit everything you know uh, there are times that I'll do series and some people cherry-pick and they have you know whatever their their messages of the day but uh, you know when I was I was uh, really charged to become a pastor my training is through the Calvary Chapel system and through Chuck Smith, who believes in teaching through the Bible, entire books. And so you get everything. You get the, the, the stuff you want to hear, and you also get the stuff you don't want to hear. Um, and so I'm blessed that, that this was my training, because a lot of people, a lot of teachers and pastors get focused in on what they like to preach about. And there are things in here that I don't like to preach about, uh, just like everyone else. But unless we hear all of it, we're not going to really gain from any of it. Because we need to have all of the gospel of Jesus Christ and all the teachings of God's word. And uh, John is uh, uh, getting up in age as we, we've spoken. And uh, we went through 1 John, now 2 John. And um, he's, he knows his days are running out. And he, um, he's kind of really encouraging the church. He's actually crying out to the church because he's watched the church start to veer off. And in 1 John, we, we kind of saw a little bit of that. Um, we talked about idols and we talked about things that were infiltrating um, the gospel, infiltrating the, the followers of the way, which was Jesus Christ. And, uh, and John had a more intimate connection with Jesus than virtually anyone that he walked with. And I don't know if you ever realized that there's only one apostle that wrote a biography and wrote letters to the church. John is the only one that did that. You know, the other gospel writers wrote their, their biographies and their gospels. Luke got the chance to write the historical account of the first church. But as far as uh, encouraging the church, teaching the church, John is the only one that, that really had both callings. And so um, he's getting near the end, and uh, he knows he's the last the last connection to the people that actually walked with Jesus on this earth. And at this point, he's been following Jesus for 80 years. That's a heck of a, heck of a, heck of a ride. You know, 80 years. And, um, and so, you know, I started to, to look through First John. And um, I, I encourage you, re read ahead. I also encourage you, when you read the Bible, read and look for things that don't make sense. Because I'm looking at this, and I've read it, I read it 10 times, 15 times, and I'm looking at it, it says, it, it sounds very much like First John only in one chapter because John kind of has the same things that were important to him and so you read and you read and you read and um, and all of a sudden something doesn't make sense you know and I mentioned this before you know, sometimes you read the Bible and it's like well that's an odd way of putting that well there's a couple of things in this this chapter that really unlock something that I believe is going to uh, going to open our eyes to the, the realm of Christianity then and the realm of Christianity today. And uh, it's going to give us discernment because that's what John is worried about. The believers seeing what's real, what's not real, what is true and what is not true. 
So I want to read through the whole chapter. It's only 13 verses. And he starts to the elder, the elder to the chosen lady and her children, whom I love in truth. And not only I, but also all who know the truth. For the sake of the truth, which abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and in love. I was very glad to find some of your children walking in truth, just as we have received commandment to do from the Father. Now I ask you, lady, not as though I were writing to you a new commandment, but the one which we've had from the beginning, that we should love one another. And this is love that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, that you should walk in it. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the Antichrist. Watch yourselves, that you do not lose what you have accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching, he has both God, both Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house. Do not give him a greeting, for the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. Though I have many things to write to you, I do not want to do so with paper and ink. But I hope to come to you and speak face to face, so that your joy may be full. The children of your chosen sister greet you. Now a lot of that sounds very similar to First John, doesn't it? And actually some of it sounds similar to the Gospel of John. Um, and, and you read these things over and over and over and, and all of a sudden you kind of read slowly like you know that this is here for a reason. You know, John just didn't have a book and the Holy Spirit didn't decide this was part of the Bible for no apparent reason. Other than maybe John wanted to add something or might have forgotten something. And we're going to see that is actually the case here. That John needed to add something to his first teaching. There are three words in, in one of the verses here that, that really started me thinking what, what was here that was nowhere else. And in verse 9, it has these words, gone too far. Sounds like an odd phrase. Make sure they don't go too far when you're talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And these words haunted me and haunted me. And so what happens is when you really study the Bible and you, you ask the Holy Spirit, he'll point something out. And then what you do at that point is you go back because those words will make everything else come together and now it all makes sense. You know, if you look at the beginning of the, the chapter, um, John is talking about truth and truth and truth and truth it's almost like he's obsessed with this thing called truth and um, truth was not being preached in the church anymore see what happened in those days is they were traveling evangelists there were, were good teachers that would travel from town to town and go house to house and people would invite them in and they would, would stay for a while and they would be fed and they would support their ministries but what happened with the early church, and this also happened with Paul, is when the gospel gets preached, these other people come in afterwards. And there was a movement within the, the, the Christian church, almost have made a big mistake there, <laughs> <laughs> that the Gnostics started to get infiltrated with the Christians. And what happens is what developed was a, a Gnostic realm of Christianity. Because I don't know if you know what Gnosticism is. But I'm going to tell you what Gnosticism is. So what Gnostics believe is there's a spirit God, big God, a spirit realm. Where all the high things of God are and creator God is. And then there's creation and creation is basically corrupt. It's, it's evil. And there's a separation. You know, and uh, you've probably heard the, fr the phrase uh, agnostic. You know, it's, uh, I have friends that are agnostic. One of my friends that's president of one of the clubs is a devout, if you could be a devout, agnostic. 
So it's people that believe there's a God, there's something out there, but he's out there and there's no interaction. He's just out there. And so what was happening here is that the Gnostics were getting involved in corrupting the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what Gnostics believe is there's this entity called the Demiurge. The Demiurge is a lesser God within the realm of the God Spirit. And it's actually a corrupted version of the pure and powerful Spirit God. And so the Gnostics were saying this is what Jesus was. He was God and he was a spiritual entity. But he was a lesser entity and his purpose came down so he could interact with us so we could strive for something better. That he would be our connection to the spirit realm and the God stuff and the spirituality and angels and all these things. And it sounds almost like Christianity, doesn't it? But what happens is they diminish Jesus as just being something you need to get so you can get there. And they corrupted the teaching of the Bible. And so people started delving into the spirituality and the excitement and the tingled senses. And all of a sudden, yeah, they were, they were bringing Jesus, but Jesus as the way to get to the higher thinking, to get to a higher place of enlightenment. And so Jesus was just a tool and they even presented uh, a, a teaching that, well, he wasn't really human. He was a lesser God that came and interacted with us for the purpose of connecting us to God in some kind of spiritual relationship. And so it was just, Jesus was a tool. Well, I want you to understand tonight that Jesus is everything. It is all about Jesus. It has always been all about Jesus. And Jesus is the end of the line. When you arrive at Jesus, you have arrived. Amen. I hope, I hope you all know that. And that's a vital understanding in this place. Because what happened was, um, this is like our journey to, to faith. We've probably all had this journey. And we kind of come to an understanding that it must be, there must be a God, right? Creation, there must be a God. And then, then we start to kind of seek. We start to have friends maybe that are talking about this church stuff and you know how God has maybe changed your life and, and Jesus was, was kind of part of it. And then we get curiosity. And then the Holy Spirit starts to uh, infiltrate your thinking a little bit and starts drawing you and wooing you. And maybe you show up for church service. And maybe you hear some songs that you feel something going on that you've never felt before. And then you, you come to a moment where you might even say a prayer because you're moved and the journey has led you to say a prayer. That's not salvation. There has to, become a, there has to be a time when you make a conscious decision with all your essence that I will surrender my entire will, my entire life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and give him all of yourself. That's when salvation actually happens. And then what the Bible tells us is when we get to that moment, we have one thing to do the rest of our life. Abide in Jesus. That's it. Jesus is the end of the line. But what happened was these Gnostics would come in and they, they knew the Bible. Well, they knew the scriptures and they knew the stories. And so they had... They had this idea of enlightenment that we're going to lead you to Jesus so that we can, we can reach up to the heavens and we can live in spiritual realms and we can have our emotions tingled and our excitement tingled and our, 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 our lusts of, of just the extraordinary and the miraculous. And so what happened is they're on a journey and they reached Jesus and they went right by him to the spiritual to the tinglings of the excitement and the revival experience and the stuff that we all know and now you start to read this and you understand why why John starts uh, 
to the lady and children that I love in truth. Also those who know the truth. So that word know actually means a physical understanding. When it says you know the truth, it means you've experienced the truth. You're, you're living the truth. And then he says, for the sake of the truth that abides in us. And then you see why John is, 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 is addressing these people in the church. And when he says the children, you notice he says not all the children are abiding in the truth. He says oh, only some of the children. By the way, the, the popular thought, um, actually the most people consider, this is a kind of a cryptic way John is talking to a church. You know, there's no lady identified. You know, like when we have things in our life, even our motorcycles, we, we refer to it as her. You know, just as, as human beings, when we refer to something that's an inanimate object or something, it's always her or she. It's never a he. I don't know why, but that's just what we do. And so the, the most common thought, really the vast thought amongst all the theologians and the people that study the Bible, is he was talking about the church and the children of God in the church. And they were being dragged off and they were going right by the cross. They were going right by Jesus Christ. They were brought into a journey. We see it all the time. People are brought into a journey towards Jesus Christ. And unfortunately, they don't stop at Jesus Christ. Because they want to go there. And the problem is the journey ends at Jesus Christ. It's a road that's paved with, with just the Holy Spirit teaching us and guiding us. And then we arrive at this place and then there's a dirt road that has fireworks at the end. And so they bring us here. Wow. I, I want the fireworks. I don't want that. And the problem is most of the people that bypass Jesus and go down the dirt road don't find their way back. There's a lot of convicting things in the scriptures if you go to I believe in Hebrews where it says those who have tasted of the heavenly gifts and have experienced the miraculous and have laid hands on people that uh, it's impossible to bring them back because they went right past Jesus to that and that becomes such a draw and such excitement as they won't give that up for nothing and they've passed the cross and they've never abided in Christ and John is pleading with the church. Do you see what's going on? Because these Gnostics have everybody excited, looking for the excitement in this new faith. And they bring them into places that really we don't, we don't really have to be. I don't know if you understand that. We don't have to be up there. See, because Jesus came... And Jesus is here. And he says, Lo, I am with you now and forever till the end of the age. Here in the human realm. That's why it talks about they don't believe that Jesus, and they won't pre pre preach that Jesus came in the flesh, or Jesus was the Son of God. Now, a preacher is not going to say that, but by implication, the way they're presenting the gospel, and the way they're presenting this spiritual realm. They're saying that, you know, the most extraordinary thing in, in the history of faith, our faith, any faith, is that God himself came down and became a human being. And still he was God. Jesus was fully God and fully human. And that's why he should be the end of the road. But if we have a philosophy where he wasn't really human, he was kind of a spiritual, conceptual imitation of a human. And he was just God that came down in a lesser God thing then we have no connection that we can tie in tightly with him. So we're going to go right past him to the, the miraculous and the supernatural and the fireworks and the show. And that's what the Gnostics did is they drew you right past there and brought them up there. They convinced people that mercy and grace and peace were not enough. Mercy and grace and peace is not enough. Faith, hope, and love is not enough. You need more. Jesus is not enough. Oh, Jesus is good, and Jesus is an important part of the puzzle. And we have to come through this area where Jesus is to understand and everything. But Jesus' only purpose is to bring us there. That's a lie from the pit of hell. 
to life from the pit of hell. Jesus came so we could abide and we could have peace and we could have love and we could have hope and we could have mercy. We could have comfort and we could have purpose. You know, when you go through 1 John and you look at all the proofs of the eternal, I show you these things and I tell you these things that you may know you have eternal life. There was never revivals. You know, there was never crazy stuff. You know, this is proof of eternal life. There's nothing in there about the miraculous. There's nothing about the supernatural in there. It's all about loving more, walking in truth more, being tighter family. That's what eternal life is. And the funny thing is when you, when you grasp that and you abide in Christ, the miraculous is free to show up from time to time. You know? We don't seek those things. You know? Jesus said, you, you look for a sign. You're a generation of vipers and and just evil people. You're looking for a sign. But when the church started, there were people who just couldn't get out of this looking for a sign. And they were whisked right past Jesus into something else, and they left Jesus here. And you notice what John says about that when you go too far. In verse 9, anyone who goes too far does not abide. And that's a word that we should understand and the teaching of Christ does not have God does not have God that's an indictment does not have God when it talks about abiding in the teachings of Christ no actually it doesn't say abiding in the teachings of Christ it says abiding in the teaching the understanding and the life of Christ abiding in the teaching of Christ not what Christ said but the teaching of learning and becoming intimate in relationship with Christ that's where we abide and what are those things what are those things that we're supposed to abide in love God love others what are the things that are, are Jesus serve others accepting forgiveness and giving forgiveness stay in Christ in God in fellowship learn to love at a higher degree be in community to help, care for each other, support each other, sacrificially, be in His Word, understand truth, love, the way, and that's what life is. That's where we are supposed to abide, and that's where we are supposed to stay, in Christ. It's all throughout the Scriptures. But we like having our senses tingled. And God knew that. John saw it happening. David in Psalm 131. David, one of the most spiritual men of the Old Testament. But he knew. He knew that he didn't want to get involved and in, get entangled in searching for things that he didn't need to really get involved in. He said, Oh Lord, my heart is not proud, nor my eyes haughty, nor do I involve myself in great matters or things too difficult for me. See, we have a simple gospel. We have a simple Savior. We have a simple truth. Love God, love your brother. And he gives us how we do that. And that's what this is about. But we like to have our senses tingled. God knew that. And that's why John had to write these, these things. Everything is about Jesus. All we will ever need is Jesus. He is all sufficiency. He is all power. He is all understanding. And that's where we should stay. And not get whisked into these other these other areas otherwise we by implication are saying Jesus is not enough Jesus is not enough I don't know if you could say that I can't say that Jesus is all I need the spiritual things those things that we all know are out there we've been there we've been part of them I don't need that I need Jesus because Jesus is where mercy and peace and love and hope and faith and compassion reside you know I had a, I had I had a miraculous thing happen to me two years ago I had my heart healed I didn't need it I didn't need it because I understand understood then what I understand now is I have more family and more love than I could ever need in my life I have more purpose and I have 
I have a family that we do life together and we live together and we love together. My heart is my heart. My life is my life. I'm going to abide here with the body of Christ and bring all my energy here. You know, I take, I take uh, hits sometimes when people, they hear me talk and, you know, I can get critical. You know, I'll probably cross a line sometimes and people come in here sometimes and they see and they, they hear the gospel. They see people that are, are growing, you know, but they got this stuff that they, you know, they want to bring here, whether it's experiential things or, you know, stuff like that. And so they say, you're holding them back. You're holding them back to greater things that God wants for them. And you know what? I am. But it's not greater things that God wants for you. It's a problem that Gnosticism has attached itself to Christianity. And when I look on the television and I pick up the radio and I look on my iPad, it is more prevalent than the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Gnosticism is alive and well. And it's more than a big chunk of Christianity. And I say that loosely today. Because John even says God is not with that. God is against that. They've left Jesus Christ behind and sought for something better. There is nothing better than Jesus Christ. You know, we got love, we got peace, we got community. Everything we need is right here. That's why God gave us giftings. All of you are a gift to each other in this place. You all bring things. You all have things. You are gifts. Paul talked about this in Colossians when he was uh, addressing problems in the church of Colossae. They had Gnostics, they had people bringing in false religions and false teachers. And they said, let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-indulgence or self-abasement. And the worship of angels, taking his stand on visions he has seen, inflating without cause by his fleshly mind, not holding fast to the head, which is Jesus, by the way, from whom the entire body, being supplied, held together by the joints and ligaments, grows a growth which is from God. You know that Satan will mimic everything that the Holy Spirit can do, right? Do you know that? He's the great impersonator. Well, see, the problem is when you go right past Jesus, everything you're encountering is not of God. They may say it's of God, but it's not of God. Because if Jesus is not the preeminent thought, and if everything doesn't come back to Jesus, it's not of God. You've gone right by it. You know, there's, there's an end of the road for us, and it is Jesus Christ. And then the miraculous comes. And the miraculous shows up. And yes, signs and wonders and cool things show up in Christ. But when you search those things, you're searching for something you shouldn't be searching for. We search for Jesus Christ. That's it. I think Paul said it when he was talking about, you know, when, uh, when he was talking about religion and how it was a bunch of garbage. And he said, um, he just wants to have a surpassing knowledge of Christ and him crucified. Paul knew that's all that mattered. There's a growing knowledge and an understanding of Jesus Christ. The thing about these traveling evangelists, these Gnostics that came in, they don't have to come in your house today. We invite them in. And they're right there. We've invited them in. When you understand what Gnosticism is, that it's the search for the spiritual at the expense of concentrating on Jesus Christ, it's Gnosticism not Christianity this is John this is why this letter was written it invaded the church back then it has invaded the church of today you know and they have fancy posters and they have events and you'll see revival meetings and a night of powerful whatever dropping out of the sky and yeah sometimes I mock it because sometimes I think things need to be mocked because Jesus Christ is dead serious. 
Faith in Jesus Christ is dead serious stuff. Life and death. Eternal life and death. And we have to point things out that are not right. And this place will always be focused on Jesus Christ. Doesn't matter what comes through these doors. We'll always focus on Jesus Christ. That's why John says in verse 8, he says, Watch yourselves, you don't lose what we have accomplished, but you may receive the full reward. What he's saying is, people in all sincerity want, they want an answer. They want Jesus Christ. And, and they're, they're brought on this journey, as I explained before. And, and they're brought here on the premise of that instead of abiding in Christ. And they go right by it. And what happens is they forfeit something. That's what I think um, Peter said, Paul said. You forfeit. Over here it says, uh, don't lose what you've accomplished. See, you can start to have victory and you can start to have God move in your life before you get saved because that's part of the process you start to feel a little bit of victory you have to say this stuff's real you know and so the problem is when you bypass Jesus Christ then you don't stop and just make it all about Jesus Christ do you know what you lose? do you know what you lose? salvation you passed it you went right by it because that was more important. Jesus is the most important thing in the history of humanity. Period. We have to make this all about Jesus. People in here have had the miraculous happen and show up. We've seen it. We will see it. We'll experience it. We don't seek it. We don't strive for it. We strive to understand Jesus and allow him to love us and to love him more. And we do that through family. See, in this place is everything we need. I'm going to go right near, right to the end. I'm going to cut this short. I have this stuff, but I don't really want to. I don't want to complicate what I want to say to end this. This is the destination, and I'll tell you why. We're called to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. Do you know that's our calling? That's our vocation. Each one of us has been created for a purpose to be a part of the recreation of God's perfect kingdom here on earth. And it happens in church. We're all a gift to each other. See, people come in here from hard lives. And they've never had a mother who loved them. And if they're here, they will find a mother who will love them. They may have not had a father that was good to them. Well, they will come here and through the experience of family and fellowship, they will find a father that they always wanted and never had. People who have never had real friends, they will come here and they will have more friends than they could ever have in a lifetime. And this is the kingdom of God that is appearing here because we share lives and we share everything we have. And there are people who <sighs> there are people who will come to a church they've never had children. God will provide them children. It's a miracle of this. I don't understand it, but it's here. And it happens in all different ways. Whatever is lacking in people's lives, they come to a true fellowship. And it's here. And somehow God miraculously provides it. Sometimes we don't understand it because how can that be? Because that's the kingdom of God. And people encourage. And people love. And people are brought here with needs needs to be needed there are people that come here and their need is to be needed and people here will need them it goes on here all the time and every need is in a gift that God brings to his church sometimes in ways that you never really thought it would that's why I'm 
a little emotional right now because it's amazing to watch the miracle of a family of God because we are the miracle we share everything past the point of logic sometimes and we supply each other's need relationally tangibly in ways that you can't imagine this is where everything ends that's why Jesus talked about the church that's why John has been all about the church that's why all Paul wrote was how we do church together that was whole, Paul's whole purpose is how do we navigate the brokenness of, of humans and build this kingdom of God here so we can show miraculous things to the world because it's not about anything else but Jesus Christ and if we look to the sky we don't look around Jesus never came so we wouldn't look at each other and look to each other and look for each other he came so we could be the body of Christ in this little book is maybe one of the most profound things we need to hear in today's day and age because much of Christianity has us searching for something that goes right past the answer because we all like that stuff and we all like excitement we all like adrenaline and we all like fireworks and Jesus never said it was about that you know never said it was about that it's about this and that's why I will always keep this place in Jesus Christ we will not go past Jesus Christ you know I don't know if you ever get sick of hearing the name Jesus Christ but I'm going to push that limit <laughs> because sometimes I think I got to make up for the people out there that aren't saying Jesus Christ you know and, and that's where grace and compassion and peace reside and mercy see if you look to the beginning of that chapter I'm going to end on this words sometimes are strange aren't they you know we hear Paul and we hear Peter and we hear John write letters and they start letters you know, grace and peace to you and they'll end letters may the grace of Jesus Christ and peace be with you but in the beginning of this chapter he says it a little differently but he's talking about truth and he says if you are in truth then grace and mercy and peace will be with you it's the only time you'll see in scripture there's a condition on grace and mercy and peace because you need to be in truth Jesus is the way the truth and the life truth is in the middle for a reason he is the way to what he is the way to truth through truth we get life truth is the only tangible thing that is in there being in Christ the other two play off truth I don't know if you understand that truth is everything truth is being in Christ at rest we rest here and we stay and we abide you know, that's why you look through the scriptures it says abide, abide, abide and sometimes we don't understand why that's such a big thing you know, it's only those that abide in him you don't go too far you don't stop short you stay you surrender and you become one with Jesus you know like I and the Father are one I wish that you be one and then it goes on to say I wish that you be unified as me and the Father are unified that's us it's a powerful letter when you understand it's coming against the very thing we fight in Christianity today making it about other things you know and I'm going to preach this everywhere I go because people need to know that Jesus is everything he's the only thing you know to hear Jesus talk and he says I and the father I and the father you can have me and the father 
You notice he doesn't say a lot of stuff about the Holy Spirit. You know why? Because you know what enables you to be with him and to be with the Father? It's the Holy Spirit. All the Holy Spirit is is a facilitator. It's not the main attraction. We don't search for him. We search for Jesus and the Holy Spirit in us puts that in place and puts it in motion. Jesus now, Jesus forever, it's the only thing there is. Because when you stand there that day, there's only one face you're going to be facing. And nobody else. Amen? Amen? This has got me riled up. This week, I just got, I got riled up. Because we need to let people know what it's about. You don't want to draw people in under false pretenses. You want to let them know what Jesus actually does. With the family and love and taking care of each other. Providing things that will blow your mind. Taking care of your needs. Giving you purpose. Maybe you're coming, I don't know what I'm here for. And all of a sudden you come to a church and there's people that need whatever you got. Whether you're an encourager, whether you're a mechanic. You know, whether you're a carpenter. You know, whether you got spiritual gifts. It's like, wow, I got a purpose in my life. You know, that's what the kingdom of God is. Amen. <sighs> Father, we... Lord, we, uh, at times I think, owe you an apology for making about other things. Lord, we know that you forgive our ignorance at times and, and forgive our humanity at times where we search and we strive for things because there's a, a flesh thing that we might not even perceive as being evil uh, or sinful. And Lord, we ask you to just keep your son in our conscience so we can know that everything is about him. And Lord, whatever we put in our ears, whatever we look at, give us discerning eyes so that our, our spirit isn't dragged off into a tangent and away from Jesus Christ, the author and the finisher of not just our faith, but our eternal salvation our very physical and spiritual being. Keep our eyes on Jesus. Lord, we trust Him. Lord, let no man take us away from that. Lord, we want to bless you, but we want to bless our Son or our Savior. Lord, we can't thank you enough for sending us the answer for living this life in an incredible environment though that we might have this family. Let us rest here and understand that grace and mercy and peace abide here. And we just thank you for calling us, choosing us for some apparent reason that we'll probably never understand. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. fire in his eyes and a sword in his hand and he's riding a white horse across this land he has fire in his eyes and a sword in his hand he's riding a white horse all across this land and he's calling out to you and me you ride with me. He has fire in his eyes and a sword in his hand. And he's riding a white horse across this land. He's calling out to you and me. Will you ride with me? Will you ride? With me, we say yes. Yes, no. We'll ride with you, and we say yes, no.
say yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. We'll ride with you. He has a crown on his head. He carries a scepter in his hand. He's leading the armies all across this land. And he's calling out to you and me. Will you ride with me? Will you ride with me? We say yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. That fire in his eyes is his love for his bride, and he's longing that she be with him right by his side. Yes, that fire in his eyes is his burning desire that his bride be with him right by his side. Can you hear him calling out to us right now? Saying we'll ride with me. Lord, I know what I want my answer to be When you say, will you ride with me? Don't want anything down here Holding on to me When you say, will you ride with me? Can you see that number no man can number? Riding alongside Jesus. <laughs> but he's calling out to us right now, saying, Will you ride with me? And we say, Yes. Once in a while? Okay. In, the, in this letter, John says that when we're in the truth, we have grace, we have mercy, we have peace that's available to us. You know, when, when you're in this other realm, um, there is no grace. You can see it because they look down at people like us. That's why I get it, you know, like I'm holding people back. Peace, they're very 
bipolar with their peace. People are caught in that. You know, when you're, you're abiding in Christ and you're in truth, you do have a peace that passes understanding. You know, when the chaotic things come, you, you still have peace. That only comes in Christ. Amen? Amen? Father, as we leave here, Lord, let us keep the main thing the main thing. Lord, let us just be focused and centered on your Son and his cross. And Lord, using that as a building block for everything in our life. And, and Lord, let us never lose that and, uh, and get dragged off into, into tangents that might be eye-appealing, emotionally appealing. Um, Lord, because we want grace. In here, we want grace for everyone. We've had a grace extended to us, and we want to be people who extend grace to everyone. That we know we're not better than anyone else. Lord, that we're just broken, messed up people, and resting in you. Um, we're just victorious. And Lord, just bring more peace to your people here. Let them understand as they center more on Christ, the peace will settle in them. They will be at rest, and they will be in an incredible place in the palm of your hands holding them. And Lord, as we go out into that world, protect your, your children, protect your church. Lord, let them know the power that they have in them. Let them know the power that is within this family goes out that door with them. And then through this place, you say to everyone as we walk out that door, we will never leave you. We will never forsake you. That's a corporate statement of the body of Christ. And Lord, we just thank you. Thank you for everything. In the, the name above all names, the only name by which a man might be saved, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.